you're here, you I have any first time. And uh, this is our wastewater treatment plant. It's about two, three blocks over here. Here's my treated wastewater. That's where we go. Who got it right? And I was here for a couple of years before I even knew that it's more than an underground. So we're, the quality is pretty good. The wastewater treatment is, plant is big and really needs to go off the island for personal reasons. The drinking water plants on the other side, the bridge, number four bridge, the drinking water supply wells have been moved about four miles farther inland to the salt water. <clears throat> Starting in 2016, we had consistent exceedances of state standards for DPHM and team on their DEP consent order. And I just came on the board when that started working for <laughs> um, And Greg, uh, Greg was uh, designing a plan for us, a drinking plan for us at that time about five, six years ago. And they explained that our city's water is difficult to treat. It's got high organic, high iron, high hardness, and a lot of variability, and particulates that spread. That water treatment filters. Um, high organics are because we're down in the wetland area, not up in the mountains of Bronson. Um, so we got a lot of lot of wetlands growing, and and a lot of organics come off of that in high iron, which was causing our disinfectant byproduct issue. Um, Greg came and designed a plant for us back then. What was that? Five, six years ago, seven years, and it was about five million dollars. And we went ahead with some pilot tests and we had a little bit of problem with the pilot test, mainly clogging treatment filters. Then about, um, about a year ago, you guys came up with a, a second time. And it was back off the island uh, four miles farther on. And we did a pilot test on that one and we also ran into some difficulties on the pilot test. Um, at that point, I started looking around for better water in the area, looking at all the well data. And there really wasn't a lot of good water down, down where we were. Bronson looked like it had some really good water. We went to Swanee River Water Management District for help. They um, had a feasibility study that they, and real quickly, about what, six, eight months, where's Leroy? They came, the uh, wetland solution came up with an answer. And they, they looked at all the different options we had here in Cedar Key, um, reverse osmosis, everything. And they really came up with the best idea was to build a pipeline. Bring good water, drinking water down, and take our Cedar Key sewage and the other area. So, so and, and, uh, Leroy has told us that it's best to kind of get different entities together in, in, rather than us at Cedar Key trying to go and get the money alone. Now we're servicing a lot more communities. We requested $104 million for a pipeline to the Pony River Water District, a lot more than it was established for that. $36 million for drinking water, $8 million for wastewater. And at that time, Swanee River requested that we form a regional entity to potentially receive the money in the fall of 2023. The attorneys for Bronson, RT, Cedar Key have drawn up a tentative co op agreement. I, I used to work for DEP and I worked in uh, surface water quality assessment. I know chemistry pretty well, biology pretty well, but I don't know how to find $100 million. That was not part of my. I do not know how this works. So we we got you guys to explain a little bit about what your processes are as far as getting money and, and making it work. And Leslie, did you want to? Exactly. Just... The Swanee River Water Management District for 
And unfortunately, you're either going to have to use the down arrow here. Just be careful of those wires. Thank you. Well, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, everybody, for having me here tonight. I'm Susanna Folsom, Director of the Withlacoochee Regional Water Supply Authority. Ooh. Okay, so we, um, we were created back in 1977, and that was mostly in... Um, because there were several water interests to the south of us that were interested in running a great big pipeline through the area um, and taking the water down to the Tampa Bay area. Um, so back in the 1970s, uh, the Withlacoochee Regional Water Supply Authority was created. Um, our main goal is to be a water supply um, development and planning agency. And we want to really look at um, creating water that will meet all of the growth needs in the future in a way that reduces any environmental impacts and um, doesn't create um, or, or avoids the creation of a water use caution area like there are in several other areas in the state. So the area that we're at is the red, the four red counties there. Um, the yellow star shows where we're at right now in Cedar Key. Um, the map on the right shows our district and we're kind of bisected by the Southwest Florida Water Management District and the St. Johns River Water Management District. Um, now Levy County, where we are right now, was an original member county of our authority. Um, they did exit in 1982, but just throwing that little fact out there. So we are created and we have the benefits of a water supply authority based on Florida statutes 373 and the kind of um, authority that that gives us. Um, it was created specifically in that Florida statute so that water supply authorities can develop water supply. Um, we can levy um, ad valorem taxes up to 0.5 mils. Uh, we uh, get priority funding from the water management districts, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we can issue revenue bonds. We can go into debt, um, but we, we can't, with our legal structure, um, we can't have local distribution of water. So um, just to understand little nuances and differences, I think Jeremy will talk a little bit more about his authority later, and they have the ability to, to actually deliver supply to customers. But we are supposed to be regional and wholesale in nature. The water supply that we delivered is supposed to be given to other municipalities and um, entities that deliver then to their customers. So we do um, have an interlocal agreement between our four counties um, and four cities that are a part of our board. We um, all that agreement is subject to Florida statutes 163 for inter interlocal agreements and we abide by all of those requirements. We do have 13 members that are all elected officials on our board. Um, our funding for our authority comes from the sale of water. Uh, we also have a 19 cent per capita assessment for all the um, people that are in those four counties and that's assessed to the counties and paid to us in quarterly installments. And we also um, get quite a bit of funding from the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And we just um, are about to sign our first co-funding agreement with the St. John's River Water Management District. And we have our um, current board members there on the slide. So the water supply that we have is the Charles A. Black well field. And we have two water plants as well. Um, that was uh, the water, the well field was created constructed between 1988 and 1992. And um, the current permitted capacity of that well field is 4.6 million gallons a day. And we are in the process of renewing that permit for an expansion to 6.6 .6 million gallons per day. Um, we have quite a bit more capacity and machine capacity. 
all of the water that we're producing right now goes to Citrus County. We do hope to expand that in the future, but right now it all goes to Citrus County. So one of our main functions is to do regional water supply planning for our four county area. And we do that in a five year updated plan. Um, our last one was issued in 2019 and we're working on our 2024 update now. Um, as part of that plan, we look at future demand projections, population projections, looked at existing water sources, how long they're gonna last. We do hydraulic modeling or hydrologic modeling to determine um, what impacts pumping, future um, projected pumping is going to have on minimum flows and levels. And if you're not familiar with those, those are levels that are set by the state to protect springs and rivers, um, wetlands, lakes, aquifer levels, depending on where you're at in the state. Those levels have been set to make sure that any permitted pumpage does not affect those beyond those minimum flows and levels. So these are some of the demand projections from our last plan. And it looks like um, those are demands from 2015 to 2024 or 2040 are gonna um, increase by about 25 million gallons per day. That's a 28% increase. So we're gonna really have to make sure that we're tracking those demands. That's why we update our plan every five years. Um, right now, we're not in a situation where we're running out of groundwater yet, but it's starting to look a little bit tighter, especially with as fast as growth has been in the last few years. So some of the water supply sources that we look at and quantify in our plan, um, we look at additional groundwater that's projected. That's kind of the first source, the easy source, the cheap source of water that's available that everybody's already using. Um, we look heavily at water conservation. That's the low hanging fruit. The easiest way to develop new supply is to reduce existing supply usage um, and try to make sure that you're using every drop of that water as effectively as you can. We look at reclaim water. So that's the water out of your wastewater plants. Where is it going? How can it be more beneficially used? Um, we're following very closely the setting of minimum flows and levels on the Withlacoochee River. We're hoping that could be a surface water supply source of alternative water supply for us in the future. It's being set in 2024. And so we're definitely watching that very closely. Um, we've looked at seawater desalination. We could potentially co-locate with the Crystal River Power Plant. Um, and we are also looking at potable reuse as a future water supply. And that's treating wastewater all the way to drinking water standards. So one of the benefits of being a regional water supply authority is that you do get prioritized funding from the water management districts. And this is a, a this slide shows in the Southwest Florida water management districts funding scoring criteria that they give um, in their strategic goals criteria, they give an additional 10 points to you if you're a regional water supply authority. And if you don't meet um, either a regional water supply authority or um, meeting one of their strategic funding initiatives, you don't get any funding. Um, but we've seen, especially in, in recent times where funding is starting to get pretty tight, um, the benefit of being a regional water supply authority and getting those extra points and actually getting the funding and not being underneath their cutoff. St. John's has similar criteria. Theirs is in their alternative water supply and water conservation funding. They also give um, prioritized funding to regional waters and regional water authorities. If you have a regional benefit, they'll give you prioritized funding for that. So I also looked since this part of the district is in the Suwannee River and maybe Mr. Marshall can talk about it a little bit more. Um, they do have a cost share program. Each water management district is a little bit different, but it looks like they have the river program. And that gives you a whole 20 points um, for regional effectiveness. So all of the water management districts do it a little bit differently. Um, but being a regional water supply authority does have those benefits. Um, in addition to that, if you can develop a resource regionally, there are economies of scale rather than ever, many and small entities creating something. If you have it a little bit better, you bigger, you should be able to do that at a smaller unit cost overall. 
one of the main things that we do, um, in addition to our supply planning and our well field and water supply delivery, um, we also try to promote conservation efforts. Um, we do that through our residential irrigation evaluation program. We actually send a professional out to residents, users that are um, targeted, that are high users, anyone using more than 20,000 gallons of water per month um, are eligible for the program. And we contact them by letters. They um, let us know if they want to be a part of the program. There's no cost to the customers. Um, we pay part of it. Our cooperating um, utilities pay part and water management districts pay part of that. Um, we also give grants to um, promote water conservation. And we give those currently our, our grant holders are Hernando County, Citrus County, Marion County, and Sumter County, which just happen to be um, the four counties that are part of our district. And that's the end of my presentation. So I'll be uh, happy to take questions on the panel or Leslie, do you want me to take questions now? Okay. All right, if that's okay, unless there's some burning questions, um, we can just wait until then. Greg, you're up next. So Greg Lang with Mid Tower Associates. Many people we've worked with Greg many a time. And um, let's see what I need to do here. You're going to come around here, uh, Nature Coast. Mm -hmm. And he's going to talk about the Nature Coast Regional Authority. It's this one. And you can either use the arrow buttons or the arrow one. button down. Why is that? OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Just the down button. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, uh, Greg. With, uh, Representing Nature Coast uh, Regional Water Utility, it's an interesting water and wastewater utility. It's very local to Cedar Key, and it's one of the smallest around. And the reason I'm here tonight is because there are no employees. There's no real budget for that authority, but they're doing great work, and they're served by multiples of uh, jurisdictions, which I'll talk about. But it has a real, I think Nature Coast really works in our discussion for Cedar Key Water and Sewer District. So what do they do? They provide water wastewater services. They're interested in springs protection and access for recharge because of where they're located just up the road, Gilcrest and Dixie County and the cities of Sandy Springs and, and uh, Bell. And we're there to protect environmental and public health and support, support the local economy. So it was created with really, first it had about six entities, but what our current membership now is Dixie Levy County. So it started with a little bit larger membership and then it shrunk. So this is, I think, is, is important. Of course, you know, each member um, has the power, which is interesting. I think maybe the way Cedar Key, Bronson, and Otter Creek want to look at their authority or their cooperative is they want the power to fire, own, improve, operate, maintain these systems pursuant to Florida law. And Nature Coast was uh, granted uh, its authority by section 163 on statutes. And they're not a taxing authority, but they also have the ability to keep their own jurisdictional water and wastewater services. So in other words, municipal members may continue to in their own boundaries. And that was important to these folks. They said, look, we already have systems. We're happy to join this cooperative, this authority uh, to help our neighbors, but we want to keep our own services. And that's been working fine for over a decade. Uh, Dixie County, however, had to establish a service area for allowing Nature Coast to provide potable water. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And Nature Coast does assume the obligation to meet the needs, future needs of their members. So it's a it's a very, very important obligation that they took on. So I thought this would be helpful to our Cedar Key folks. I call it lessons learned and observations. So board members are appointed by the respective jurisdictions. So in the city of Fanning Springs, it's the mayor who's an appo appointed to the board of Nature Coast. Dixie County, it's the county manager. Gilchrist County, the county manager. Town of Bell, it's a commissioner. And these folks serve as unpaid, dedicated volunteers. Uh, I am very, very impressed, like I am with our board here in Cedar Key. These folks really want to solve problems. They don't have 
side agendas. They get together once a month to conceptualize projects, get them funded and get them built. They have no staff. Again, that's why I'm here because they really have very little budget. They capture a little bit of revenue. They're not a taxing authority and they really rely on, um, on my firm and, and their, their own folks uh, to show up and, and do the work. So because they're so small, my firm also the applications, the, the working with our, our partners, all the engineering, planning, design, permitting, bidding, award, all you would expect, all the construction administration, the grant and project management, the contracts, compliance items. There's lots of Davis Bacon and American Iron Steel and now some new stuff. Um, and then all the financial reporting and tracking. So that's one of the things we specialize in. So we're happy to do it for them. And so there's a lot of challenges and opportunities. And one of the things I found really interesting about this board is when they get together, they reach out to their members and they say, you know, what problems do we really want to look at? What do we want to tackle? And, but also one of the challenges is that makeup has changed since, in, since, it was in, since its inception. So one of the things that I've been so impressed with over the last uh, 10 or 12 years is the quality relationships with everyone that they work with, the funding agencies, the regulatory folks, their legislators. And this is, um, I think it's been a key part of their success. And something that we all know, but I think it's worth saying again, is a project takes years of effort, plan, fund, design, and construct. So I've been helping serve Nature Coast with, with my engineering team for at least a dozen years or so. And we're on our third project. So that's not that fast, but that's how it works. So you're shaking your head, yes, Suzanne, because you know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and I also think the other thing for the, our board to understand Cedar Key Water and Sewer District is board members and their consultants should have very low turnover to make sure they see these projects to the finish line. It's, it's I can't stress how important it is. Then I thought I'd touch on a couple of projects because of one, I love construction and I want to explain a couple of projects that they've tackled. So. The project number one was there was a problem. There was arsenic levels, very unsafe arsenic levels in drinking wells in Dixie County. And it's a complicated wells that have above the legal limit of arsenic. So Nature Coast said, well, we want to help Dixie County. How do we do that? So the solution was obviously to design a pipeline from Fanning Springs, the water is coming from Fanning Springs across the Suwannee River to Dixie County uh, to Old Town. And this was uh, some years ago, the, so this, these numbers wouldn't work today, but there was about 2.1 million and 100% grant. And by the way, the other thing that has to happen for Nature Coast Regional Water Authority and its members, because they're mostly, not mostly, they're all low to moderate income communities and counties, is they really have very limited or no ability to take on debt. So grants were critically important and 100%. So we uh, designed a pipeline to go from Fanning Springs across the Swan River. And I, again, I love construction, so I'm gonna show you pictures of pipes. So that piled Highway 19 corridor all the way to Old Town. And then we hung And, and that project's been completed for quite a few years now. <clears throat> so second project was um, in Gilchrist County, they came to Nature Coast and said, we've got a beautiful campground right on Otter Springs on the banks of the Suwannee River, 100 RV sites, septic tanks that were put in so long ago, nobody knows where, where they all are and whether they work or not. The spring had very elevated levels of nitrates. So the solution was design and construct a wastewater collection system. And because there was no wastewater plant nearby, we said, we've got to find an innovative system and DWTU stands for Distributed Waste Treatment Units to decommission those septic tanks. That project, I just did a final walkthrough last week. It is done and that was 2 million funded from DEP, 100% grant. What was interesting though is, and there's a couple of project photos. You guys see some camp in the back. The camp wanted to stay open against uh, my better advice. And they did throughout the whole project. And now they are on a collection system and a treatment system, which will treat their waste to AWT standard, advanced waste treatment standard. And because they're in Swanee River Basin Management Action Plan area and a priority focus area, they have to meet those standards. 
So this is the innovative system. There's three tanks, 20,000 gallons each, we put in the ground that have various components, aeration and things going on inside them that treat the waste to a high level. It's still considered innovative by DEP. And so we're gonna monitor the water quality throughout uh, the years to see how well uh, it's meeting the AWT standards. This is what that ground looks like now where those tanks are all under the ground and some controls. And it's being monitored remotely from Tallahassee uh, as to the water quality and the functionality. So we're gonna watch this one closely because it could be a wastewater solution for some of our unincorporated areas in Levy uh, County where a wastewater plant really can't reach or the, it's just does, it is feasible for financing. Um, I'm anxious to see how this, uh, how this works. And so is DEP and Swanee River Water Management District. And this is the absorption bed, the last stop in the treatment train after we pump it to those tanks, <clears throat> it goes to this large absorption bed. And there's uh, lysometers installed, which are a, a name for uh, a tool that at the bottom of the absorption bed, it'll put how that nutrient reduction is going. Swanee River will go out and collect that data on a regular basis. So we have high hopes for that. Again, this project was very successful and is now finished. And then the last project, well, that's a, a wet well, that's a, a pump station. So here's project number three with nature turns. So the problem here was Lancaster, and this is in Gilcrest County as well, unincorporated Gilcrest County, Lancaster Correctional Institution has a prison, I think with about eight or 900 prisoners, there's some of them just got a certificate for being good prisoners and uh, seriously, and they, their plant cannot meet AWT standards and it just is not, wasn't constructed to do so. So we went out, <clears throat> talked with Tallahassee, talked to their uh, folks, the engineers at the prison system and talked to these folks locally and said, well, here's our idea. We can get the funding. We will build a pump station pipe your effluent all the way to the city of Fanning Springs advanced treatment facility and treat it there and then do some other things with it, which I'll hit on really quick. And that was funded about $3 million from DEP wastewater grants. But I also noted there's some federal money in there, some ARPA money, which is American Rescue Plan Act. So that's kind of where we're, what we're doing here tonight. system with our force main all the way to Fanning Springs Advanced Wind Treatment Facility, which is now in design phases, Mercy City, keep them that way, threaten them that way. And that, the other thing we're going to do with their wastewater as we treat it to the, the advanced treatment level is we're going to build design, we're designing an aquifer recharge structured wetland. So we're not only just going to treat the wetland, the, the wastewater to the high level that's required, we're going to send it back to the aquifer for recharge, which is very, how long is that pipe? That's only about three or four miles. And uh, you know, the old town pipe, the water pipe was only about five or six miles. And that's it for me. I didn't want to take any more time. Continuing up the peninsula. Executive Director of the Clay County Utility Authority. Green. And you are, let's see, you're the one with the faucet in it, right? Share. And again, down our here or there. Thank you. Well, good evening. And on behalf of our Board of Supervisors and the entire CCUA team, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to come talk to you uh, this evening, talk about Clay County Utility Authority, who we are, a bit about our vision and mission and our work toward a sustainable future. And I will say it's exciting to participate in this type of workshop of what you're visioning for the area here. So I'll work, walk through a number of things, a little bit about my background, a little bit about the Utility Authority, our vision and mission, and then how we interact with the county government, how we're organized, how we perform financially, and some other uh, topics related to our, our business model. So a little bit about me. I have 27 years of engineering, construction, and operations management experience. Yes, I am a Gator graduate. 
uh, and I'm also associated with a number of national and state uh, professional organizations. So I hope I have a little bit of credibility that I know what I'm talking about as we move through here. So uh, a little bit about the uh, utility authority. What is the Clay County Utility Authority? Uh, we're a special legislative district. Uh, and how that originated was the county commission uh, purchased three private utilities back in the early 90s. And those three private utilities coalesced into a uh, department of the county and the county. And there was leadership at the county that saw a need for a, an entity that was dedicated to water, wastewater, and ultimately what became reclaimed water services. And so out of that leadership of the county, they uh, went to this uh, legislature to form the, the legislation that ended up creating the utility authority. And that was formed in 1994. So that legislation, the idea behind it is that we're a government entity that is designed to work like a business. So how we're structured, we do have a supervisory structure. I report to seven supervisors. Six of those seven supervisors are appointed by the county commission. One is appointed by the governor. As you can tell by the list of our infrastructure, you can kind of see that we're spread out a fair amount. We have a lot of water treatment plants, wastewater facilities, and reclaimed storage and pumping facilities across the county. Um, we have roughly 55,000 customer accounts. Um, we are in the Jacksonville Municipal Service Area. And what's unique to us is about 92.5% of our customers are residential. And so many of them uh, travel northward to work in, in Jacksonville. So we're very much a bedroom community. So starting out, uh, we have a vision statement and it's about providing long-term sustainable value to our customers. We start out by conserving and protecting the uh, natural resources, but there's a public health and safety mission that is central to us in providing clean, safe, economical, reliable water, wastewater, and reclaimed water services. When I became executive director, I proposed a new mission statement. And in that new mission statement, obviously our central mission of protecting public health and safety was first and foremost. We included the incorporation of the conservation and protection of water supply through the diversification of our portfolio. But all of this is dependent upon highly trained professional work staff. And we've invested a lot in that. So a little bit about how we interact with the Clay County government. As I've pointed out, uh, six, and seven, six of the seven supervisor seats are appointed by the county commission. We participate financially in the enabling legislation uh, we contribute four and a half percent of gross revenues to the county, and that is a due in lieu of taxes. And so we raise funds based upon our operation rate. So we have uniform rates, fees, and charges for all of our customers across the county, and that generates the due in lieu of taxes. Uh, the coordination with the county, there's a lot of communication and collaboration. When you look at the comprehensive planning in the area, we interact with the the county there, both on the planning department, service availability, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of interaction on the right of way because storm drainage, roadways, uh, our utility infrastructure are often in the right of way. Uh, conflicting infrastructure is always a challenge uh, when either you're expanding existing roads, rerouting roads, new roads, et cetera. And there's also communication and collaboration that involves permitting. We do have to file permits with the county. On top of that, the county does have projects that they have to permit with us. Uh, the county fairgrounds is a great example. They're looking to expand the fairgrounds and a number of new facilities, all of which are gonna re require permits for, uh, from us. So there is uh, a lot of communication and collaboration between uh, the two entities. And one of the things that I think is important in both my counterpart, the county manager and myself, we understand we all serve the same people. So our customers are county taxpayers. Those taxpayers are our ratepayers. So there is a vested interest in treating uh, those customers and those ratepayers uh, equitably, and we serve them to their benefit. 
So where do we provide service? In our enabling legislation, our service area is defined as the unincorporated area of Clay County. So that's a massive area. But our service area is actually concentrated in two distinct areas. Uh, the one that you see multicolored up there, those are our northern service area. And out of that 55,000 accounts, that's about 53,000 of them. Uh, we have the lower southwest corner, which is Keystone. We have a little bit under 2,000 customer accounts in the Keystone Heights area. There are two municipal service areas that are in the county. Uh, one is the town of Orange Park. Uh, the other is the city of Green Cove Springs. Now we do have interconnects with those communities. We work collaboratively with the town and the city, but they are distinct utilities on their own. So a little bit about how we are structured. Uh, when I became executive director, we went through a, a pretty significant reorganization. Uh, first and foremost, we're focused on customer service, that public health and safety mission. Then we reorganized amongst four disciplines to deliver that customer service. So when you look at our chief financial officer, that he's responsible for the financial disciplines, which involve customer service, billing, uh, the procurement, inventory control, et cetera. When you look at how we uh, manage our capital assets, when it's a design, service availability, construction, inspection services, asset management, those are in the engineering disciplines and that's under our chief engineer. Operations is our wastewater treatment, water treatment facilities, uh, distribution and collection to our customers, that is direct operations and that is under our chief operations officer. And then we have two components that are under our chief human resource officer, obviously managing our uh, human capital, our professional staff and risk and safety is under that chief human resource officer. So how do we perform financially? So when you look at how we're organized, we have to come up, we develop every year with an 18 month ahead forecast, what our expenses are going to be for that year. So those expenses are then used to calculate the revenue need. So there is a match between revenues and expenses. That covers our operating costs. It also covers our debt service charges, covers the due and lieu of taxes. All of those are calculated into what those rate fees and charges are. So we make sure that we balance those revenues and expenses. Included in there is a contingency that we budget for because unforeseen events happen. Hurricanes is a great example. And so there is a contingency. Now, as a government entity, we're not a business to generate a profit, but that contingency generally is at the end of the year, a surplus. And why that's important is that surplus is then transferred into the capital side, which helps minimize the amount of debt the utility takes, takes on. So it does help our rate payers in minimizing that debt. So what I have up here is a number of our ratios that we look at on a monthly uh, and quarterly and annual basis. And we do watch those ratios. To what is our revenue? What is our debt? our operating ratios, current ratios, return on assets, et cetera, because we are to run like a business and sound business policies and practices yield solid results if you're tracking them over time. And you'll notice one X up there, that's a debt service coverage ratio that is directly related to rates. And I will say in our strategic planning effort that's going on, we are gonna recommend policies to the board that for what de debt we take on, that we maintain a certain debt ratio, coverage ratio, that's gonna be about two. So we will be consistent with national uh, standards. So how do we manage the capital improvement program? I, the other uh, presentations talked about capital projects and we do go after uh, grant funding and other funding sources, but we also generate uh, we do have our own debt that we take on that's either for bonds, uh, uh, competitive notes, uh, uh, as well as uh, short-term lines of credit. And so through that, we monitor our capital program. Starts out with 
planning our work ahead of time and then working those particular plans and then making sure the projects we're identifying in time are accurately scoped, they're properly scheduled and properly budgeted. So if we have those things on a five and 10 year interval, and we're even moving to a longer term uh, plan in our integrated water resource plan to look at 20 year horizons of what that capital is. And so right here, you'll see that we have roughly about $250 million. That's the end number in September 24 that we're looking to have in play in either design or construction inside of a two year window. Uh, the board just recently approved a hundred million dollar line of credit for these capital projects. Uh, you may ask why a line of credit versus a note or, or a bond. We see our financial management see the uh, credit markets improving dramatically over the next 24 months. We will build these projects and when the interest rate market is improving, we will lock that debt in in uh, better interest rates. Because when you look at one percentage point or 100 basis points, that can make a significant difference on your carrying charge in your operating budget. So next, what is the big deal about growth? Uh, CCUA, we're focused uh, uh, on our forecast that have us growing uh, to be about doubling in size. That's adding anywhere from 25 to 45,000 customer accounts over the next 20 to 25 years. That increased population creates increased demand on those very water resources. This increased demand creates a need to diversify those water resource portfolios to making sure you're treating the water that you have available to the level that you need. Uh, currently, CCUA's water supply portfolio is 100% from the aquifer for the potable side. We have roughly a third of our customers that use reclaimed water for beneficial irrigation. So as we double in size, size, both the demand on the potable and the reclaim are going to become stressed. So we're looking at things like potable reuse, surface water, surficial aquifer, and a host of other things. And so those are investments in new infrastructure and technology that we're looking to pursue because our position today is because of the investments that we made in the 1990s and early 2000s. And we wanna maintain that tradition of forward thinking. This growth also stresses the need for greater regional partnerships and solutions, because there are some things with pressure on our water resources, whether it's the aquifer, uh, whether it's uh, lakes, streams, springs, et cetera, we're not going to be able to meet those things strictly within our service area boundaries, which makes the need for regional partnerships and uh, regional solutions that involve the utilities, other stakeholders, the water management districts, and the DEP incredibly important to the entire region and to the state of Florida. Now, this is all well and good when you talk about an expanding population and projects and plants, et cetera, but you can't take your eye off the ball on the existing infrastructure. Every piece of in infrastructure that you build will age and ultimately have issues where you need to replace it. So that goes into your forecast and your capital budget to make sure you are investing properly uh, to, for renewal and replacement of those assets over time. And all of this is based on the expectation that you continue to deliver safe and reliable water, wastewater and reclaim uh, water services to uh, your customers. You can never lose sight on that public health and safety mission. And so finally, what does sustainability mean? So first and foremost, I think is economics of the rates, uh, because you can't get the rates so high that it displaces the, the balance of the economy. Uh, and we've heard some of the, I uh, talked a little bit on the other presentations about uh, the various uh, income and demographics of other communities. You have to take that into account when you are setting rates. It involves alternative water supplies. We cannot strictly rely on the aquifer al alone. You have to look at what treatment is necessary for what services you're going to deliver. The low hanging fruit is obviously to conserve and protect the existing water services. I've heard, I heard in one of the presentations about uh, services that are offered to customers about water conservation. 
we offer that free to every one of our customers. We have a three-day continuous usage service that we provide to our customers. And what's coming is soon our customers will be able to log in and actually monitor their own water use and set alarms, et cetera. And so right now, CCUAs, when you compare us to 2008, 2009, our conservation is about 25% from that particular base year. We're about 68 gallons per day per capita uh, in our service area. <clears throat> now, all of this is well and good, and I'll go back to the need for the development of a well-trained professional workforce. Um, I can talk about capital projects, I can talk about programs all day long, but if I don't have the staff that knows what they're doing and how to execute it, to run the plants, to connect with customers, to get things done, uh, it's not gonna happen. It really is based upon that well-trained development staff. And that ties into maintaining the operator, operational condition of the existing utility system. You have to continue to invest in the operation and maintenance of those facilities. And so with that, that's my presentation. I wanna say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and I know we're going to have the Q&A session in uh, just a little bit, and I'll answer questions then. Very interesting. This was not planned. Um, various authorities. So last uh, is actually our district attorney. So he and his law firm are involved in a project up in the Panhandle. And Evan, give me just a minute. Or Is this the right one? Yeah, I know I've got to get the right screen one. Yep. Okay, that. So, was some, okay. And, um, okay. So you can use the, the arrow here or the arrow here. Okay. Moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. So, as uh, Leslie mentioned, my name is Evan Rosenthal uh, with the law firm Neighbors Gillen and Nickerson out of Tallahassee. Um, I am the uh, Cedar Key Water and Sewer District General Counsel. I also happen to be General Counsel for another utility authority, recently created utility authority up in the sort of central panhandle area, um, Highway 79 Corridor Authority. And so we thought given sort of some of the parallels between the, the two projects, um, recently created authority uh, within the last five years, smaller fiscally constrained entities, water sewer authority, that it would be good to sort of talk about the Highway 79 corridors experience as we sit here, uh, the three entities sit here and, and think about how to move forward with the proposed Wakasasa project. So the Highway 79 corridor authority is an independent special district unit of government that was created uh, pursuant to section 163.017G Florida statutes, um, which is the same, uh, the same statutory tool that uh, is proposed to be used here to create the Wakasasa uh, cooperative as well. Um, and it was created by Holmes County, Washington County, and the, uh, the city of Bonifay. So for those not familiar with these entities, it's sort of central panel, about halfway between Tallahassee and, uh, and Pensacola, um, just about due north of, uh, of Panama City. Um, that's about, that's roughly where the, uh, uh, the authority sits. It's, it's at the intersection of I-10 and Highway 79 as well. Um, so the purpose of, of the creation of the authority, um, and there were, there were different ways to kind of go about this project, but ultimately the three entities decided they wanted to create their own separate unit of government. They all wanted to sort of have a stake in this, in this project, and that's how they decided to do it. And the purpose was to construct water and sewer improvements to extend water and sewer service into a currently unserved area that's south of I-10 on Highway 79, um, portions of which are located within the jurisdictions of each of those three entities. Um, Highway 79 was recently four-laned by FDOT, and so each of the three entities, they really saw this, they, hi they, they uh, highlighted this corridor, the Highway 79 corridor, as an area ripe for economic growth and development. Um, they all look at it very, uh, they, they think the conditions are very favorable there to growth moving forward. Lots of folks driving down from Georgia to the coast and whatnot. Um, so the four-laning really was a huge impetus to, the, to this project. Um, and so that, that was the purpose to construct these water and wastewater improvements. And then, and then upon completion of the project, the idea was for the authority 
who serves the, as the retail water and sewer provider. And then also do some non-utility stuff too, assist with um, sort of general economic development. And we'll get into one of the grants that's got us and job, have some job growth components to it. And so they want to assist in sort of marketing and advertising the area, trying to bring in that, um, that growth and development. And also do some planning work as well. You know, you're in three different jurisdictions here. So the idea was to have them do some land use planning, do some studies, and then make recommendations to the uh, to the three different entities as to, you know, here are some changes to your comp plan or to your land development code that could help help to foster growth in the area. So I'm clearly, I'm clearly not a cartographer. I'm, I'm a lawyer. These maps are terrible, I know. Um, but here's sort of uh, hopefully this gives you some idea of where we're where we're located. Um, the map on the right here is actually the, the black outline. Each boundary that the three area this here is actually the vegetable home map. Southern portion here is Washington County, the top tier. It's in Holmes County, and the blue outline on there is the city of Arlington. So again, you've got sort of a mismatch of three jurisdictions there. That comprise the authority. So, I have a plan up there. You can see here's a little period of time here in 79. So, all the water sewer improvements really ran along in 79 here. And I can say to himself, um, the city of Boston to the north end, they are, they are the, uh, the wholesale provider of water and sewer service for this entity. So, the idea was for, for the authority to be the retail provider, all to get all their. their bulk water from the city of Bonifay, an existing plant up there, and then transmit all of their sewer again up to the city of Bonifay to, uh, to, to treat that. <laughs> so just a little bit about structure and operation of the authority. So um, this project started back in 2015 um, with the three entities coming together to form a planning committee to sort of study the options of how to move forward here. Again, they had sort of identified this area that they wanted to extend water and sewer to. And so they created a planning committee to, to study, you know, what are the, what are the options here? Um, ultimately, they settled on the creation of this independent special district, uh, separate unit of government by a local agreement, and that agreement was was uh, formally executed in uh, late 2018. Prior to creation, uh, Washington County really kind of, they sort of um, took the lead on the team, I would say, um, and they started applying for grants uh, before the entity was even formed. And they were successful in, in getting uh, some grants from, uh, uh, from two sources. We'll talk about them on the next slide um, or next couple slides from DEO and from FDEP. And fortunately, the FDEP funds, a portion of that were, was eligible to be used for startup costs, which was good. So those startup costs were funneled through Opportunity Florida and they helped to pay for um, some of those initial costs and getting our local agreement drafted and just kind of getting the authority up on its, uh, up on its feet and running. So the authority is governed by a three-member board of directors. Uh, each member government gets to select one uh, one director. Um, they've got no employees. They're they're sort of taking the nature coast uh, attack here. Um, the uh, the authority currently has no employees that they use just entirely contract service providers. So they're engineers, they're legal counsel, um, they have a general manager. They're all outside firms um, that uh, that assist the authority, and it's helped to really keep costs down, you know, at some point in the future, once once operations are up and running, you know, maybe we'll we'll look to get some of the, uh, you know, the the excellent professional staff that Jeremy talked about. I think that, you know, that would be nice to have. But right now, while the authority is sort of in its infancy, um, the contract, uh, the contract service model, I think, has served the authority pretty well. As a further cost cutting measure, they use uh, the Washington County Administration Building for uh, for meeting space. The project, um, the project consisted of the design and construction of about 2.3 miles of water and sewer lines, plus you know, lift stations and, and associated facilities. Um, for, most of the facilities were able to be located in the right of way, which was which was fortunate. They ran into very few of the spacing issues there that some of the prior presenters talked about, so that was good. There was some easement acquisition that was required for the uh, for the lift stations. Project design was completed in uh, in 2020, and then construction commenced in early 2021, the thick of the uh, the pandemic, and uh, was successfully completed in June of 2022. Um, so it, it was pretty pretty quick moving project. Um, 
and uh, and ultimately it was completed on time and and within the budgets provided by the grants, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, there was extensive coordination required with the with the member governments, particularly the city of Bonifay, who again they were our they're our bulk uh, our wholesale water and wastewater provider here. So we had to negotiate um, with them both on sizing of the, the utility facilities. There was a lot of back and forth on you know well, what what uh, what size of pipe can we use here? What's your what's your capacity look like and your future capacity look like and whatnot. And then we had to negotiate a bulk service agreement with them as well, which sets the rates um, for the city to provide bulk uh, water and wastewater treatment to the authority. And that was uh, those were some some fun negotiations. So funding, um, fortunately, 100% of the capital costs for this project were funded through were funded through grants. Um, this project could not have been done otherwise. You're dealing with two fiscally constrained counties, and the city of Bonifay has, I think, like six or seven hundred people it, it's one of the one of the only cities in the state that actually does not levy any ad valorem taxes either i'm not sure how they do it but uh anyway um so grants were really necessary for this project um there were two grants that that they were successful in securing uh, the first was it was the balance and infrastructure growth grant from deo in the amount of 1.8 million and then the second grant from uh from the florida department of environmental protection in the amount of uh, 1 million there were uh, there are job creation requirements that uh, that come along with the DEO grants, and there are some strings attached there. Um, specifically, they're going to have to show that they created 219 jobs within 10 years after the completion of construction, or potentially have to pay all that money back. Um, so the work has begun now that the project is completed on trying to bring in those companies, bring in those, um, bring in that growth to meet their uh, their job requirements. Um, as I mentioned, I think earlier, the we were fortunate in terms of when we were starting up the authority, you know, funding was limited. And so we were able to get FDEP to agree to allow us to use $100,000 of, of that grant for sort of some initial startup costs. Um, so that's so that's how the uh, the hard costs for this project were funded, your design, your uh, construction of, of, the, of the system and whatnot. Um, operating costs, on the other hand, have primarily been funded through annual contributions from uh, Holmes and Washington County. Um, and you can see some of the various operating costs there at the bottom that they've uh, that they've had to fund management, um, finance and accounting, audit, legal, uh, operation and maintenance of the water system. Now that it's complete, you've got to have a website. All special districts need to have a website. Advertising and reporting requirements um, and whatnot, and just kind of all of these these day to day costs that come along with existing as a governmental entity in Florida. So I know you know funding is a big topic of conversation associated with the with the proposed creation of the cooperative. And so I wanted I thought it might be valuable to provide some of the early year budgets for the corridor authority and we can spend as much or as little time on these slides as you like. I also have paper copies of this stuff if anybody wants. I know the font is a little small up there, so I, I apologize for that. But so the um, the authority, I started this and I took the first year of 2020. The authority was technically formed in 2018. The first full year was fiscal year 19, but that was that year was a little misleading because Opportunity Florida was actually kind of funding a lot of their costs still at that point and whatnot, or at least the funds were being routed through Opportunity Florida. So I just started this out here in 2020, which is the first like first real year of existence, I would say, where they were doing handling all of their finances and whatnot. And so you can see there at the bottom their their total um, their total operating expenses for that year. And again, this is non-grant eligible expenses were about eighty five thousand dollars. Um, then, let's go to the next slide here. Here's a detailed breakdown of their um, of their budget. Unfortunately, the zoom is kind of cutting off the top there, which shows you what years in. Yeah. So that's okay. Um, but anyway, I did write down kind of their next. Uh, we covered eighty five thousand for twenty twenty, and then the next few years. So they were at 99, almost just, just a tad shy of $100,000 in operating expenses for 2021. 
and then 2022 shot up to just under $160,000. And you know that that year, FY22, you had the uh, uh, construction really in full construction of the project really in full force and effect, and some additional costs associated with that. They also had to engage a rate consultant to develop rates for the project. Um, their audit expenses went up, um, and so that I think really uh, accounted for the bulk of their increased budget for that year. Here are the member contributions to date. Um, so just a, a summary of for, the, for each of the five years that they've been in existence. Um, again, what homes in Washington County have been kicking in these annual contributions to sort of keep the authority afloat and make sure they've got funds to fund those operating expenses, those non-grant eligible expenses. And so you can see the total there on the right, um, all, the all in number to date is just shy $300,000 for each entity. Challenges moving forward. So the authorities of Greenfield project. So this, you know, this area that there that the that service was extended to. Um, there's really not a whole lot there. It's 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 a it's a lot of uh, just open fields at the moment. Um, so they currently have no customers, despite the fact that construction was completed um, about eight nine months ago. Uh, they do anticipate the first the first customer to connect later this year. And obviously, you know, for a utility. Um, you need to be bringing, you need to have ratepayers to fund your, your operations, basically. And so that has been a source of, uh, of a source of stress for the authority as, you know, it's, it's had to rely on other sources of funding to keep it afloat while we wait for customers co to connect. And those other sources of funding are, have been the member government the counties, um, who are fiscally constrained entities. Um, and, you know, they, they need to continue making contributions to the authority in order to, to keep it going until they get enough customers connecting to reach sort of that break even point there. And that's been, it's definitely been a topic of uh, discussion and um, it, some difficult conversations at, at times there as well. Um, I also mentioned uh, the jobs growth requirement that came along with their their DEO grant. They've got to hit that 219 jobs within 10 years. Um, so that's always sort of something that's in the back of our minds. Um, we're really trying to, to do whatever we can to make sure we're, we're um, bringing in uh, development and the right type of development too. You know, subdivisions aren't really going to help them meet those job requirements. We're looking for, uh, we're looking for a commercial, we're looking for industrial development stuff along, the, along those lines. And that's all I've got for you. Happy to answer any questions or we can save it for the panel discussion as well.